The following interview was conducted with uh, Richard J. Schwartz, uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering Professor Emeritus and College of Engineering Dean Emeritus for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, October 13, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian, also sitting in his wife, Mary Jo. Good morning and Good welcome. Morning. Let's start off, tell us a little bit where you were born and your parents in early years. Oh, okay. Well, I was born in Waukesha, Wisconsin and okay. lived there uh, until I left, uh, left for college. Um, tell us about Grade school and high school and uh, family uh, siblings. It was a, uh, Waukesha at that time was a, was a small town, about fifteen thousand people, and pretty much a blue collar town. Just uh, most people there worked in the factories. Uh, it's about twenty miles out of Milwaukee, but it was not at that time not a suburb sure. of uh, of Milwaukee. Uh, the school system was very good. Uh -huh. uh, I, w I was very fortunate because there was a um, there was a Carnegie Library in town. And uh, I spent a lot of time in the that worked out right. in the library, yeah. and, and the school system was uh, was a very good school. Was system. it a large school that you went to? And what it was, a, yeah. There were about 350 students or thereabouts in my graduating class. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was it not only had students from the city, but the surrounding county uh, right. students were bussed in. So. What uh, were there student activities, and what about athletics? Were you involved in the year of that? Yeah, I uh, was pretty much involved in athletics full time because I played uh, football, basketball, and baseball. And so there weren't there wasn't much time. That took a lot that. of time, and right? So, yeah, yeah. So we moved uh, from one sport to the other. What about any, any brothers or sisters? Do you have any I siblings? I had one sister, uh, five years younger than I am. Okay, yeah. good. And then let's talk a little bit about uh, college. Tell us a little about your campus life. At University of Wisconsin. Well, I went to uh, I went to University of Wisconsin, as you said, and uh, uh, knew that I wanted to be in in electrical engineering. Uh, I had, while I was still actually while I was still in uh, junior high school, I started working for an electrician, and so by the time I got to college, I could. Uh, you got some hands on ahead. I had had uh, a number of years of hands on experience, and uh, so I was pretty sure I wanted to be. An electron, electrical engineer. I didn't think I wanted to be an electrician, but uh, <laughs> uh, it worked very well for me. Sure. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, while I was in college, uh, uh, I didn't have to work uh, while I was on campus, but I did uh, at breaks and Christmas and Thanksgiving sure. and things like this, spring break. Uh, I would call up and he would have a truck ready for me and I would be an electrician for a couple of days. Super. Uh, so that worked out. Uh, that worked worked out. out very well. Yeah. Did you continue with your athletics while you were in college? And uh, what about student clubs? I uh, well, yes and no. <laughs> I uh, we need I your help on Ma in Madison. <laughs> well, I was recruited uh, for football, basketball, and baseball sure. uh, there, and talked to the coaches, and decided that I probably should be playing baseball. So uh, I, in the fall, I, I played. At that time, freshmen couldn't play, uh, so you had a freshman sure. squad. And so I played in the fall. I practiced with the freshman squad, and then uh, decided I wasn't busy enough. So I went out and practiced with the freshman basketball squad until spring break opened. And, and uh, it was probably uh, to, to tell you how good I wasn't. Um, uh, at the end of the of the fall semester, the, the, the varsity coach came into the freshman locker room, which he never did, and he was waving the. Uh, the grade reports for the first semester, and he came in. and He says, "Where's Schwartz? Who's Schwartz?" And I'm over here, you know. And he came over and he looked and said, "Oh!" And he turned around and walked out. And uh, that gave me a hint that I probably didn't have a future <laughs> with the basketball team. <laughs> so that was sort of the end of that. And uh, did you continue with the baseball though? Or no, I, I I did in the spring, and then I suffered a, a injury to my uh, shoulder. So that was the end of my athletic career. So. I, the sum total of it is that I never played in a in a varsity game. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. Time. What was campus life like? Did, did were you did you in a fraternity? There? No, I lived in the dormitories for, okay. for four years. Uh, it was very pleasant. Met a lot of very nice people. In fact, a lot of people that are friends to this day. My my roommate is still. I still we don't see him very much, but we sure. uh, keep in touch. Consider uh, yeah. friends and uh, uh, Wisconsin is a beautiful campus, and it was a very uh, very nice place, and uh, probably the best part of it was when I went there. The tuition was ninety dollars a semester, so so it was uh, a good very affordable, as were most universities, state sure. universities at that time. Right. So. Any student clubs that you had time to participate in? Um, 
No, I uh, just uh, just some uh, IEEE student. Uh, right. Uh, well, they always have a lot of activities. Sort and of things, things like professional that, sort of right. clubs. And, and the dormitory always had lots of things going sure. on. Sure, so. right. Um, then after that, uh, does that when you went out for your graduate work? No, I uh, um, I wanted to make sure before I went to graduate school. I thought I'd always thought I probably wanted to get a PhD, but I thought I'd better find out what electrical engineers did before I, I started that. And uh, this was uh, the Korean War was over, but it was because uh, you got out in fifty seven. I got out yeah. in uh, in fifty seven. Uh, I had joined ROTC, advanced ROTC. Uh, the first two years were required, and, and uh, so I had to serve some time in in the, in the army as a second lieutenant. Uh, so I um, I interviewed for jobs, uh, and, and in fact, I had uh, I took nine interviews and had ten offers. It was a good year, so they, they uh, and uh, I accepted a job with. Um, the David Sarnoff Research Laboratories uh, of the RCA company. It was in uh, just outside Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, there were two reasons why I accepted it. First of all, I liked what they did. And, and second of all, they they agreed to pay my full salary for me to get a PhD at Princeton, um, which you'll find out in a minute didn't work out. <laughs> but but uh, That's uh, a nice perk. That's a pretty good it deal. It was a very nice... Uh, sure. A very nice thing. So Bell Labs had offered to get me a master's degree, uh, but I anyway, Princeton looked like a, a good place to go. So uh, I then I spent a few weeks there actually. Well, I was married immediately when we graduated. Married you, I was gonna, did you meet your wife? And met? No, uh, we started dating while I was in high school. So, oh, okay. so, so we, you're from the same area. Same we, she was also from Waukesha. Uh, I tease her that I came from the other side of the tracks, but she was there. <laughs> Um, so um, I started working uh, almost immediately. We, the day we were married, we left town and drove to New, to Jersey, New Jersey so we could start working. Okay. Um, and our, honey, our honeymoon was the, was the trip to, to New Jersey. Um, and I worked there until August, and then I went into the Army for six months. They, at that point, uh, the, the Korean War had wound down to the point where they were pretty sure we weren't going to need lots sure. of second lieutenants. and. Uh, I was very fortunate. I was assigned to the uh, uh, the Fort Monmouth uh, Signal Corps Research Laboratories, and so um, I got out of the. I had some training first, and I got out. And within a few days, the Russians had, had launched Sputnik, and so my first assignment was to was to record Sputnik as it went over beep 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 every. I can't remember if it was 90 minutes or 110 minutes. Um, we didn't know what to do with it. We just recorded it. Uh, for posterity or whatever. For they posterity. Decide later. Uh, as, as it turns out, now it didn't mean anything. It was just <laughs> uh, the Russians had just made it beep. Uh, and, and in fact, to tell you how little we knew about the Russians at the time, uh, because I was the most junior officer there, I was assigned officer of the day duties. And this is given to the, to the lowest man on the totem sure. pole. And one of the duties was to... Uh, was to stay all night and answer the phones, and uh, to wake up the uh, commanding officer if uh, something. something important happened. And so he said, "You know, wake me up if there's something really important." And sure enough, midnight, one o'clock in the morning, the phone rang. It was somebody from Washington calling, saying that they just had a report that the Russians were launching a man to the moon. Now this is 1957. Remember. Um, uh, so I thought, well, that's probably important enough. And they gave me some frequencies to monitor on the radio and things like this. And so I uh, thought, well, that's probably important enough to wake up the, the commander and bring him down here. So, yeah, he'd be right down. Well, by the time he got there, I'd gotten a second phone call saying, no, it was a false alarm. And uh, if you look back and, and think how silly it was to think that they could actually put men on the moon in 1957. You'd, so you understood a little bit how little we knew about Right, what but we're learning. It's right. in their very early days. Yeah, and the, and the second part of that same assignment at Fort Monmouth uh, was that uh, that was the International Geophysical Year, which actually was a two-year oh, yeah. stint studying right. the Earth from all kinds of things. And I was uh, I went up to uh, Fort uh, out to um, Fort Churchill on Hudson's Bay up in Canada in the wintertime, January and February, two trips up to fire rockets. Uh, there were two experiments going, one to, to fire um, Arabi Highs, uh, which were liquid fuel rockets, to uh, s set off some explosive and uh, some Nike Cajuns, which were uh, 
uh, solid fuel rockets to uh, explore what the Aurora Borealis was. Um, and, and my job was to do the instrumentation on one of these, which involved having um, uh, microphones, very large uh, eight foot by eight foot microphones out on the tundra. Uh, and my job each morning was to throw a broom over one shoulder and an M1 rifle over the other and go out and sweep the, what, what little snow there was off of the uh, off of these things. The, the, the broom was of course to sweep off the the uh, microphones and the M1 rifle was to, to protect against the polar bears because uh, uh, on television when you see lots of shots of polar bears they're frequently uh, done exactly in that area. So, anyway, it was a very interesting six months in, in the army, and then I returned to the Sarnoff Research Labs. Okay, and then what? What continue on, and what came next? Uh, well, I, I while I was there, I, I worked on a number of projects. But uh, when I when I first arrived, I, I talked to my supervisor and said, "What would you like me to do?" And at that time, the Sarnoff Labs were very, very much like a university laboratory. You pretty much did whatever you felt like doing. He said, well, he said, there's two problems we'd like you to help us solve. He said, the first one is, um, how do we communicate with these new nuclear submarines when they're down under the water? And he said, the other one is, uh, we'd like to have a television set that would get hang on the wall like a picture. Um, I had some ideas for the communication with the nuclear submarine that got worked on. I, I don't think it was ever used, although I don't know, because I left. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the picture on the wall television, as you know, is just now <laughs> uh, coming about. So it's been 52 <laughs> years uh, since we had that conversation. So, so, uh, we started early and problems. moved forward. They were tough problems. Um, and then uh, while I was there, um, there was, I was told, uh, wh while I'd been up at Fort Churchill, there were some people there from the University of Michigan that mentioned to me that uh, they thought maybe I should uh, there were some exams going to be given by the National Science Foundation to, for fellowships and suggested it would be a good idea if I took those. So when I got back to Princeton area, uh, I went and took the exams. And uh, I had applied to Princeton and uh, applied to MIT uh, and I didn't hear anything from Princeton, not a, not a word. And so uh, I got a, a letter from MIT offering me a fellowship, and then a few weeks later I got another letter from the National Science Foundation uh, giving me a, one yeah. of their fellowships. Uh, so we went, up, my wife and I went up to Boston to look for a, a place, and we eventually found one. And we were actually packing our trailer and move up there when I got a call from Princeton saying, where are you? And I said, well, uh, I'm loading my trailer heading for MIT. What do you mean? I didn't hear anything from you. And they said, oh no, you're accepted. You were supposed to be here yesterday. Uh, well, it was too late. <laughs> and so uh, your, your careers turn on. I, I've told many people that I think somewhere behind a, a file cabinet in somebody's office in Princeton is an acceptance letter, but I didn't get it. So, <laughs> so anyway. That, Somebody else took your place. We headed off to MIT. Okay. Yeah. So. And so you were up there and we were up there for four years, and I got my master's in, uh, and uh, actually SCD uh, while I was there. It was a very, uh, very nice experience. It was, mm -hmm. uh, very what good. was Cambridge like in the time when you were up there? Um, it was uh, with with both Harvard and, and MIT. There was very much an academic uh, right. uh, area, and uh, it was very pleasant. We actually didn't live in Cambridge. We lived out in uh, in a, a suburb called Brighton. Uh, which uh, we lived in amongst, uh, it was a place we could afford. And we had, sure. we had uh, well, when we left MIT, we had four children. We had one when we went up there. Um, and so uh, it, it turned out to be fortuitous for a lot of reasons. We lived with the firemen and the policemen uh, in areas that were nice and met a lot of very nice people out sure. there. Um, I would drive in every morning. And uh, in order to get a free parking place, there were along the, along the Charles River, there were uh, about uh, a dozen parking places, but you had to get there very early in the morning. So I would go in early in the morning. <laughs> and, and that turned out to be very fortuitous because at that time, um, uh, Pierre Agran, who was, uh, eventually became uh, Charles de Gaulle's uh, science advisor, was visiting MIT for two weeks every semester. And he would, he would stay on France, time, 
And so he'd be early and I'd be the only one there. So he would drop in and visit with me for a half an hour, an hour at a time. And uh, it was, very a, good. It was a, a sort of a unique experience to have this very, very bright guy with lots of ideas. Sure. Drop by your graduate student office and and, and have chat. a nice conversation chat. Yeah, that's right. yeah he'd, he always had lots of ideas that he wanted to talk about. That's nice to share. It is. Yeah. It is. And uh, so uh, among the many experiences there were, were many of the really unusual uh, people we met. Uh, I, I taught a course for Doc Edgerton, who was the founder of EG&G. &G, and people my age will remember all the photographs were published uh, of a bullet going through a uh, uh, a playing card or a, a right. droplet into a, a milk, some very f famous photographs. Uh, and through him, uh, Mary Jo and I actually uh, went to uh, dinner with Jacques Gusteau for a while. So we, it was one of those times where you had a chance to really mm -hmm. meet an interesting assortment of, very of, of people. Very good. Very, as you say, very fortuitous. Right. It's very nice. But mostly accidental. All right. Um, and then about, uh, I finished my degree in 1962. But in 1960, uh, uh, a group of us started a company, uh, which was sort of the tradition around there. Lots of people started companies. And our, my major professor and six students uh, started a company to build thermoelectric devices. And uh, so when I finished, I went to work there full time. Some of the people stayed on at MIT as faculty members when they finished, and some uh, went off to the company. I, I had an offer to stay at MIT as a faculty member, but I, I didn't want to be a professor. Uh, in fact, so much I didn't want to be a professor that I, uh, there was a, at one point I, we applied for a loan to, to, to get us through, and uh, uh, they said, "Oh, that's fine. We have a Ford forgivable loan. The Ford Foundation had a set of loans that if you were became a professor, they forgave one quarter of the loan each year for, for four years, and you didn't have to pay for it." And I said, well, no, I, I, I'm not going to be a professor. And uh, uh, they said, well, that's all right, just pay it back. I said, no, it says right here where I signed that I intend to be a professor, and I'm, I don't intend to be a professor. So after we came to Purdue, my wife reminded me each time we wrote a check to the Ford Foundation, or to, to the, uh, the MIT, we, then we then took a different sure, loan. So we understand. <laughs> uh, it's something different. Anyway, the company that we started was about uh, a block off the MIT campus. The building is still there today, uh, or was last year when it was there. Um, and it was a, a, a very uh, interesting experience. It was a good start for you. Right. It was a very it good was start because I got research. exposed to a lot of non-technical things that uh, right. I had never had uh, an opportunity to. Mm -hmm. to uh, and I decided, they decided they would sell the company and I decided I would leave and, and uh, uh, my major professor who, whenever he would leave town, would call me and ask me to go over to MIT and teach his class for him and this sort of thing, and well, that was which good. I was happy to do. Sure. I, I enjoyed it. And I had actually accepted a job with General Motors in Santa Barbara, California. They had a research laboratory out there at that time. And uh, one thing due to a couple of uh, things that happened, I changed my mind. Uh, and uh, so my major professor was a consultant here at Purdue, and he said, uh, Dick, would you, as a personal favor, go out and interview? Well, you, he was a close friend and, and had done a lot for me, so as a personal favor, I, I came out to interview, even though I didn't want to be a professor. And one thing led to another. It was a very nice place, and so they made me an offer as an associate professor. and. Uh, I accepted, and as we came out, I told my wife, well, we'll be, we'll be here three to five years, and uh, <laughs> I retired 45 years later. So. There are others that are in the same club, right. <laughs> including right. myself. Right. <laughs> so that's how then I Then you run. start. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's then, uh, so you, and your uh, initial appointment, then talk a little bit about that. Right. And so when you came, what well, some of the things? Uh, yeah, I was... Uh, I was hired uh, as an associate professor, uh, and did that include tenure? Did you get with tenure? No, tenure came two years later. But okay. I, I, quite frankly, I was a naive young kid. I didn't know, I sure. didn't know about these things, and so right. I, first of all, I didn't know it was unusual to be to come in as a associate professor. And so, so uh, I, I really never paid much attention to it. It was uh, something right. that happened, and, and I think. I think in those days it was a little different than it, than it is now. So, I think you're probably right. So uh, it's it's uh, today that wouldn't have happened. I mean, I wouldn't have 
Right. Where did where did you uh, one question? Where did you live when? What was housing like when you came? Uh, very tight, oh. particularly with somebody with four children. Uh, so we uh, we actually uh, uh, I was here looking. We I couldn't find anything, and then uh, someone told me that the Journal and Courier came out at eleven o'clock outside the Journal and Courier office before it ever got circulated. So I waited down there, and when it came out, I found there was a new ad for a house on Indian Trail, and uh, so I immediately called, and we f so we rented a house. But it was very, very tight. Uh, we lived there for one year. Um, they wanted to sell the house, and they wanted to not re-rent it f until the classes were starting in the fall, and I said, well, uh, I could see the, the, the six of us living in a, in a trailer someplace if I didn't do something. So, so uh, I went to uh, the housing group at PRF. PRF, and yeah. And they were very good about it. And they actually found a house for us right over here in the middle of campus. It's, it's still there. Oh, that's uh, good. Uh, over on Russell Street. And so we lived there for six months while we had a house built. Mm -hmm. and so, but yeah, housing was very, very tight mm -hmm. at okay. that time. Well, you lucked out anyway. We yeah. did. We right. had, and Purdue yeah. took good care yeah. of us. So go ahead and talk a little bit about your uh, growth and through the double E. Well, um, my particular, I decided that I would work on um, an area called thermal photovoltaics, which is something I had, in fact, was a result of some of my conversation with, with uh, Pierre Gran. Uh, it was a new area, and so uh, for the first few years I was here, that's what we did. And uh, the solid state laboratory was just, had just been, started and so sure. we spent a lot of time building up the laboratory and in fact in the following years we built one of the very first integrated circuits laboratories, fabrication laboratories in the country uh, over at Purdue, uh, over in the lab. And, and so I focused very much on the teaching and, and, and research at that time. Um, John Hank, uh, Ben, I'm sorry, uh, Bill Haight was the head when I was hired. In, f in fact when I came for the interview Bill Bill picked me up at the Purdue Airport and didn't drive me to the double E building. He drove me out to the golf course, pulled up into the parking lot and said, 18 holes south, 18 holes north, and then we drove to the double E building. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, that's kind of good. And he would call <laughs> occasionally for me to go out and play some golf. <laughs> so it was it was very nice. So we we worked hard on, on trying to build up the, uh, this relatively new area of solid state and, and transistors and right. integrated circuits and. and uh, uh, that's really pretty much the way we spent uh, the time. Then John Hancock became head in uh, uh, about 1965 or so. Um, and I joined the faculty in 64. And um, he, uh, I, I was concerned about the curriculum and that it had not kept up with the, the, some of the, as were a number of the young faculty. And then there were two things about it that were uh, needed, in my view, needed some changing. Uh, one was um, it was still, it was very much power focused uh, as, and uh, the electronics that they did was very much uh, vacuum tube based. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so a lot, of, a lot of the faculty, a lot of the young faculty worked at, at trying to build up uh, the, to move to a uh, newer era with uh, solid state electronics and, and, and this sort of thing. So we put together a laboratory. And the, the other issue in my mind was, was the curriculum was very rigid, uh, very power focused. Um, and so uh, uh, Professor Hancock, who was head at the time, uh, I think got tired of listening to me about it. So he made me chairman of the curriculum committee. You're an assistant head for instruction for, for a long well, time. Well, after I made the mistake of trying to do something, <laughs> uh, we uh, we actually revamped the, the curriculum a lot and made it much more flexible so so students can. And, and to this day, much of that still survives, in the, at least the procedures and things that were set up. And then about that time, uh, John asked me to be uh, the assistant head for instruction. Okay. Uh, no sooner had he done that than he left to become dean. So, so we were. Oh, was of engineering here. A dean of engineering yeah, here. Yeah, right. And uh, uh, Ben Coates uh, came, uh, who had been at uh, Coordinated Sciences Lab in Illinois, came in to be the head. And uh, Ben was uh, 
Ben was uh, trying to do some of the same things that we were trying to do, but uh, his focus was trying to bring us along in the computer area, and so uh, a lot of work. And in fact, Ben Coates uh, was responsible for starting the engineering, uh, uh, the engineering uh, computer network. Started out with a a couple of borrowed machines. He borrowed some of the research machines and right. tied, he wanted to network the machines together. And uh, he hired a young student at that time, uh, George Goebel, who's, as a matter of fact, still here. Uh, this started to grow. They got uh, they got some deck machines uh, at the time, and George was very clever. He figured out how to uh, get almost. Uh, he got about 180% of the performance out of a deck machine just by buying spare parts uh, and adding them to the machine. So he had a, he had a two uh, uh, a two CPU uh, <laughs> machine. Uh, deck found out about this, and their technical people were ecstatic. In fact, they started been giving us machines or helping us get machines. And all we would do is buy the the, some of the, the machines cost about a quarter of a million dollars, and for about fifty thousand dollars, we could have the equivalent of the second one. <laughs> And then the marketing people found out what we were doing and they shut it all down because they figured it would be better to sell two machines <laughs> than one in a small fraction. Right. Anyway, that, that was the start of uh, the computer engineering network, which stayed within. Uh, it, it became useful enough uh, uh, throughout engineering that it grew out of electrical engineering and started um, uh, helping and, and working with all of these all schools the engineering, of engineering. Right, yeah. But it stayed under the direction of the... Uh, head of electrical engineering until the time I moved from being head to dean and then the administration was moved over mm -hmm. to the to dean's office and now it's part of uh, ITAP. ITAP, yeah, that's yeah. right. So, but uh, it's really, it really it made big inroads. It, it really made was big inroads good. at a time when, when we were really leading the country in, in, uh, right. in the networking of computers and, and, and this sort of thing. So right. it, it, right. uh, I think Ben Coates' work really uh, made right. a, a yeah. large impact. Talk a little bit about your research that uh, you continued on with it there. Well, we uh, we worked on, as I said, on what I call we call right. thermal photovoltaics, and the idea there was to in to heat up uh, a, a body. In this case, it was silicon carbide uh, using uh, a fossil fuels. Uh, it would glow. Uh, we would take the uh, the, the radiation from that and use what today would be called a solar cell uh, to uh, convert the radiant energy into electrical energy. And, and the, 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 the clever part of the idea that this was Grand's idea was to only take uh, parts of the spectrum that were very efficiently converted by the, by the photovoltaic cell and to return the rest of the energy to the source. And so they, the Thermodynamic limits were, were very different on the potential, and uh, what that meant was we were designing uh, photovoltaic cells to operate at very high radiance levels, uh, meaning that that if you took the we would be operating at uh, 10 to 100 watts per square centimeter. Uh, the sun, if you stand out and hold your hand out in the sun, you're getting about uh, a tenth of a watt per square centimeter. So that we were running at 100 to 1,000 times. Um, it turned out this didn't go anywhere. I mean, there was a lot of research done. In fact, to this very day, they're still doing research on, on, sure. on the idea. Um, but it also turned out that in the mid-1970s, uh, there was an, one of the, the early uh, oil crises and energy crises. So the, the, the U.S. started a terrestrial uh, program in photovoltaics. Before that, uh, primarily it was space-based. Mm. and uh, it turned out that the cells we had done, designed were very, very efficient and could be used with solar concentrators. Um, and so uh, we wrote some proposals uh, to uh, NSF, uh, and then there was a, uh, an organization spun off by NSF called RAM, Research Applied to National Needs, and then that eventually was picked up by the Department of Energy and spun off. Um, and so we were one of the early uh, universities to get supported under that program. Uh, and uh, as it turned out, uh, these cells, actually the cells that we designed, this was about 1975, are used to this day 
in commercial solar concentrators with very little change in, in the design. In fact, I can recall getting a call from a company about the time we did this uh, saying uh, that they would like to license the, uh, the intellectual property. And I said, well, we don't have any patents on it. Um, I had filed with the university to, to have a patent and they waited until a few days before the time was to run out. Uh, I got a call from the, the lawyer we would, to write the claims and we went out to a place called Sarge Bills, this was, was out on the bypass. Right. And over liver and onions we wrote the claims, but uh, then the university decided not to go ahead with oh, it. Okay. <laughs> so um, that turned out not to be a good idea, not so much for the universities, but the companies were reluctant to, to put money in if they couldn't get patent protection. But one, uh, at least a couple of companies did. And uh, that design is still being used today. Um, just just now, in the last couple of years, some other designs coming along look to, to be uh, significantly good. better. That's kind of nice. So it was, was kind of nice. Sure. It was, right. it was, um, yeah. So uh, that research, and I've been involved in, um, in photovoltaics ever since. Uh, All right. We, What's funding out of that in those days? Well, it was it was interesting uh, on the funding. As I said, we mm -hmm. uh, we we'd, we'd applied to the National Science Foundation, which then passed the proposal on to RAN and then to the Department of Energy, and then uh, our, we were funded. But it turned out that Sandia National Laboratories was the was the entity that was uh, uh, the contract monitor, and um, I can recall when we got the first contract from them, and it was probably 1975 or thereabouts. Uh, one of my friends said, oh, you're really lucky. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, they'll fund you forever. I said, this is a one-year contract. And they said, no, no, that's part of the old AEC. Once you get in there, you're in. Uh, <laughs> well, as it turned out, uh, we had funding for 25 years. <laughs> he was right, and I was wrong. Uh, and, uh, oh, that's nice. It, it turned out to be uh, a very nice arrangement because uh, uh, I had a series of very good contract monitors, and we were able to, we were building, actually building the cells here in our laboratories, and then Sandia built a, a, a very large facility with uh, dozens of technicians and this sort of thing. And at, at one point they said, well, why don't you let us build them, and you can do the, the simulation and sure. theory. And, and that's, so we then took a turn toward uh, computer simulation of solar cells. and. Since then, we probably simulated every commercially important, and some not a very important, uh, sure. solar cells. So that's that's very nice. What uh, my students and I have been doing yeah. for for a time since 1975. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, being head of electrical and computer? How that came about, too? Yeah. Um, <coughs> And after, ben, after Ben Coates resigned in about 1983, uh, we brought in uh, a fellow by the name of Bernd Hofinger from the University of Minnesota. And he was here for a relatively short time, until about 1985. And then uh, I had acted as uh, <coughs> uh, interim head between I Ben Coates and uh -huh. Bernd. And then when, when Bernd left, uh, I was interim head again. And uh, I. I, I was not very interested in being hit. <laughs> in fact, I had, after when when, when Ben left, I had resigned as uh, assistant head. I'd been there for eight years or whatever it was. It sure. was long enough, and I wanted to concentrate more on research and, and teaching. And um, I can remember uh, uh, Henry Yang was was dean at that time, and Henry would call and say, are you busy? And well, you would, but Dean calls, you're not busy. And so <laughs> we would go off to a restaurant someplace and he would spend three or four hours asking about what the head should do and all these sort of things. And then uh, he would say, uh, have you ever thought about being head? And I said, no, uh, it's not something I want to do. And we would have these long conversations. Henry was a very persistent person. So he, so eventually I said, well, okay, let's, let's give it a shot. And, and, it, the application went into the committee, and, sure. and so I became head. And uh, it turned out to be uh, uh, more interesting than I thought it would be. It was uh, it was a good time to be um, head of electrical engineering. We our enrollment had 
from, from a low point of about 650 or so undergraduates, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, it had grown to about 1,365 by the time I was, right. was head. Let me ask you a question. Uh, was it at that time they added computer engineering to it, or, uh, we, that or was had a, that been done? It was while I was head, what, okay. what we had done was um, actually, and, and I think Ben was still there at that time, we had decided that we should have a computer engineering degree but we didn't know how well that would be accepted by the corporations that hired most of our students. And so we didn't offer a computer engineering degree, we offered a, a dual degree which was electrical and computer engineering. It was a single degree, met requirements of both computer engineering and electrical, and electrical. engineering. So it was, a, it was a hard job for the students. And for many years we offered that, as essentially a, that is a single degree but sort of a dual. And then it became With clear. two facets to it. Two facets yeah. to it. But they, it actually uh, passed ABET requirements for both electrical engineering and computer engineering. So, so at that time, we, electrical engineering was giving two degrees, the electrical engineering degree and then the electrical and computer engineering degree. Um, then it became clear that, that the computer engineering degree would be well accepted, and uh, we went on to offer okay. the computer engineering degree. And one of the last things that occurred while I was head was we then decided to change the name of the department, and that's when it became the electrical and computer engineering okay. degree. Uh, it wasn't clear to me whether it, it, it required uh, initially approval of the faculty and then, of course, moving up through the organization. It wasn't clear to me whether the, the vote would be supportive or not, uh, and I can still remember one of the members of the computer engineering faculty, in fact it was Leah Jamison, standing up and saying that she thought the name of the department should be electrical and computer engineering rather than computer and electrical engineering as people were proposing. And uh, that was the very fortuitous thing to do. Uh, I think it was a thing that, it's silly things like that that sometimes swing things. And the <laughs> faculty vote was almost unanimous and it yeah. then went on through. <laughs> so that's, uh, so, so uh, and then the enrollment, some other things that you did as a head, uh, and some initiatives and things. We, and we, were, we were working very hard at uh, trying to increase the diversity of both the student body and the, and the, the faculty. So right. we, we worked very hard at uh, trying to find uh, good faculty members, and, uh, female faculty members, uh, uh, African-American faculty members. Uh, we had a number of Hispanics, we had a number of Asians, so it was really a focus was at that time to try to increase the, uh, or, or even hire uh, uh, an African-American faculty member. Right. And the challenge was that, that in the entire United States at that time, uh, some years there would be three PhDs, African-American in electrical engineering, sometimes there would be none. Uh, it was a very uh, challenging. Uh, the pool was very. The pool was very small. Very small. So the other thing we decided to do was to work very hard on increasing the pool. So there were a lot of efforts made. Uh, actually, when uh, John Hancock was dean, he had made a lot of efforts at uh, recruiting. Uh, to do that. To do that, right. and uh, we continued these things and. Uh, worked very hard at increasing the pool of uh, African-American uh, graduate students. And uh, we succeeded. A number of them went on to become faculty members either here or at other right. places. And, uh, and of course, at that time, the minority program was in place and also the women in engineering. And they were both strong and, and they were very, very active. In, in, in fact, uh, if you'd like, I can tell you a story about that. Please do. Uh, we. Uh, decided to, uh, at one point, uh, it was decided to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Nesby, the National uh, uh, Society, which started here at Purdue. Right. And uh, we had uh, we had invited, uh, we had a, a dinner and, and a celebration, and we invited uh, uh, Art Hansen, who had been, uh, had, uh, had been president at the time this was going on, and uh, we invited the, the first president of Nesby, the national organization. And she told me lots of stories that I didn't know about how, how supportive uh, President Hansen had been in 
getting things underway and providing funding and doing this and, and very much in the background, but uh, but very supportive, very supportive in helping yeah. her do this, and. Um, she, uh, at that time, she was um, running one of the production operations for, I think it was Chrysler. Uh, she'd gone off and done that. And, 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 and then she told me the following story. She said she'd gotten so busy uh, getting the, the national organization underway here that she'd flunked out of school and was out for, I, my recollection is eight or nine years, and, and saved up money and this sort of thing, decided she'd come back. So she came back and she was, uh, started in again, which is very difficult, of course, after being out that length of time. Oh, yeah. And she was nearing the end of her first semester and she said she was sitting in the union in the sweet shop or over in that area, and she was crying because she was failing all of her courses. And, and she said, uh, she said this black student came in and sat down next to her and he asked her what the trouble was. And she explained that she was having great difficulty and, and, and so he said, well, he said, uh, uh, we can fix that. He says, we have this organization called Nisby. And <laughs> so, and in fact, she got herself squared away and, and in fact graduated. And, that's nice. That's a nice story to share. That is. So it's yeah. a nice story. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, go ahead. And so we, a lot of our activity in terms of recruiting was fo was focused on uh, recruiting faculty members and trying to increase the pool. Right. Uh, we had uh, we had some success at, at recruiting uh, faculty members, but it was, as I said, the supply was, and it's was a big very challenge. limited, and right. we had more success at. at getting people prepared for, right. for doing this. Potter Building was built during this time, was it not? Potter Building was built, yes. And, and then and the consolidation I, of all the, the libraries was one of the big right, things there. Right, right. Um, I was not involved with getting the Potter Building put together, and I was very unhappy about losing our electrical engineering library to the, to the main library. Um, I've gotten it over it since, but <laughs> it takes a while. It was very nice to have your own library right in your own Others building. Others have shared the same thing. That's right. That's <laughs> we don't want to let go. Right. It's now. Uh, it's now yeah. where our. Uh, and there are pictures and stories too that Dean Potter would be there quite often. You know, watching mm -hmm. the building and things right. that this came. I, I did not know Dean Potter uh -huh. uh, when I came to interview uh, his successor was there, and I'm sorry, I just don't remember. Uh, who that, what his name was, but I was very impressed with him when I came for an interview. I walked, they took me over, and he spent a whole half hour talking to me um, at my previous school. That wouldn't have happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> now let's move then the the dean, the deanship, the right. College of Engineering. Right. There again, I really w did not plan to become dean. Did, was not terribly interested in becoming dean. Um, and, and, and I didn't apply for the job. And then one of the members of the, uh, the committee came to see me. And this would have been a replacement for Yang, is that correct? This was Henry Yang had left, had and left. he'd been gone almost a year while the search And then I think John McLaughlin was the... John McLaughlin filled in as the interim dean. Right. And um, so only one of the search committee members came and asked why I hadn't uh, applied. And they said, well, there were two reasons. One, I, first of all, I wasn't... <laughs> wasn't something I was looking forward to doing. And, and two, uh, I was at that point about 60 years old or almost 60 years old, and I figured they needed somebody that was younger so they can sure. uh, uh, Purdue has, as you know, uh, uh, must uh, retire from academic uh, okay. positions of dean and above at 65. Um, well, he assured me that they, they that wasn't a problem, or at least uh, they were considering, and they he would really like to have me consider reconsider. So uh, I did, and I sent in the, an application form, and much to my surprise, uh, I ended up being dean. So, and it, literally, I was surprised. That's, that, that's very. What are some of the things that, uh, one of the things that I found in your own words, the challenge will be keeping the schools up to date with changes outside the university? One of the challenges. Things, things. were moving very fast. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in, in, all sorts of ways. In, in, in the research side, things were just exploding. 
uh, with computers, with all the developments right. in, in lasers and, and uh, solid state devices, and it, just, it was just a huge explosion. It was a real challenge for us to, to not only keep up but get out ahead of it. Uh, right. So our st undergraduate students would be would be properly trained, and so our research was timely and, and useful. Uh, but there were there were other things in that as well. It was it was clear that that the state, while they were supporting us, the percentage of the uh, support from the state was was already at that time decreasing, and, and it was pretty apparent that that was going to go on. While while the while the amount increased, the percentage right. went down De decreased. significantly. Mm. Uh, uh, it was clear that there were there were a, a number of challenges in terms of diversity that we really couldn't be a an all male all white male. Uh, fraternity. It really, we really needed to uh, expand that. We were we were throwing away the abilities of a huge number of, of people right. that needed to be addressed. Um, we were. It was clear that things were going global. We really needed to be have have a global outreach. So there were there were whole all sorts of macro uh, events that were that were going on that we really needed to to pay attention to. And, uh, and and try to do that. And those were big challenges. They were big challenges. Big challenges, that's right. The um, Armstrong Hall of Engineering, were you involved in any of the planning for that? Yeah, uh, that, what, in, in fact, uh, what happened was when I, when I became dean, uh, first thing I did was meet with, of course, all the schools. And I, I knew that electrical engineering was uh, severely limited in what they could do just by the amount of space they had. There wasn't enough space, enough lab space, uh, equipment, all this sort of thing. But uh, I hadn't paid much attention to the other schools of engineering prior to becoming dean. And as mm -hmm. I went around, I found out that that was not an electrical engineering problem, it was an engineering problem. Every school was very short on space. Every school needed help with their both undergraduate, graduate, and research laboratories. Um, it was just, uh, it was a time that, that we needed to focus on, on resource. So I, t I talked to um, uh, Bob Ringel, who was the, the provost, and I talked to the president, and uh, their estimate was that we might expect to get one building in 12 years, some, sometime, uh, about once every 12 years. And, and when we looked at the need, it, Sort of far exceeded what looked that like that time we, period. This is from the state, sort of thing. Um, so, in discussions with the president uh, about about the need, and, and uh, uh, I think he understood that we really did. I know he understood that we really did need more than we could expect from there. Uh, one of the things he said to me, he said, "I really don't want to have every head approach me." <laughs> About getting a new building, he said, "I have to have a, I have to have a plan," which is exactly what we came up. We with. were doing right. Uh, so this is Dr. Baring was the president this is at that Dr. time. Dr. Baring, and and so uh, we spent a lot of time. The, the oh, heads yeah. and, the, and the faculty, um, uh, Warren Stevenson, who was an associate head at the time, uh, spent a lot of time, and we went through and we looked at the needs. We looked at how they could be met. We actually put together a very detailed spreadsheet, which went on for pages and pages of, of how we would use existing space and what would move where. And we put together a plan, which in fact uh, was very little changed uh, from, from what actually happened. Um, the Armstrong Building was was part of that plan. The the addition that's going on now, the mechanical engineering, was part of the plan. Right. Uh, the, the the chemical engineering addition uh, was part of the plan. The the Brick Center was uh, was part of the plan. So all the, uh, the 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 Bowen Building was part of what civil engineering. So so. Um, very far-reaching. We put together a very detailed plan, and then um, the day came. We it was, uh, the president, President Peering, uh, agreed to meet with us over lunch for two hours, where we would present this very detailed plan. And so we met in the union. Uh, and as he walked in, he said, "I'm sorry, but um, I have to meet with the press. Uh, there had been a flap over uh, a violation of." Uh, 
NCAA rules in the athletic area. And he said, you only have one hour. And I wasn't sure how we were going to do this whole thing in two hours. So we, <laughs> those of us who were there were sure that this was disaster. Uh, so we, on the fly, cut this down to a one-hour presentation. I, I still remember uh, Dr. Beering saying, oh, I have to leave now. He stopped and he said, oh, by the way, it's approved. And I didn't, our plan had called for sequencing the buildings, and I didn't know whether it was the first building he was talking about. <laughs> Where in the sequence? Well, I found out later it was the whole plan in, in the sense that we were approved to take it to the Board of Trustees. And so we did, we did in fact, sure. do that. Um, did your plan include the site? Uh, we did not have control over the sites. Oh. There was a lot of site discussion. Maybe uh, you could make a suggestion as to... We could, okay. uh, and they, they listened and sure. tried hard. But in fact, um, the Burke Center and, and what became Discovery Park, uh, uh, the original plan called for that to be out at the airport because that was the only ground large enough that could for be found. And uh, when the uh, uh, new president came... Uh, and we can talk about that, but I, we made a presentation to him. Sure. And he said to me, why, is, why are you putting the building out at the airport? And I said, because uh, that's the only space large enough to handle this. And he said, well, surely there must be some other space. And, and I responded that, well, there was Mary Student Housing, which was very old, and uh, that there was a lot of housing off campus for graduate students at, at, at this point. Um, so we might consider that, but it hadn't been approved. And two weeks later, I read in the newspaper that the Burke Center was going to be located uh, <laughs> out there, and they were going to do Discovery Park and, sure. and all this sort of thing. So, so what happened was that when, uh, when the new president came in, uh, Martin Jeske came in, um, he wanted to meet with all of the deans and, and have a tour of what they were doing and seeing. And, and, we decided we, we, he was going to give us, as I recall, a half day to do that. And uh, we decided that we wouldn't do that. We would use that whole time to make a presentation on, on the plan for the building. So that's fact, that's right. what we did. And he picked it up and made it better by he added the Discovery Park to it and, and sure. a number of other things. So it, it worked out very well for us. It's a great location. It is. It really, it, it really is. It's worked out extremely well. Well, it is. It, and they had to go sometime. They just hadn't <laughs> those buildings that were there for so long. That's right. And so you know, the, the Armstrong Building is, is is a very nice location. But the Discovery Park, the whole concept that he came up with for Discovery Park, I think, right. really changed the uh, really changed the culture of the university right. uh, in right. a way that I wouldn't have expected could be changed as rapidly as. As it did. As it did. Right, yeah. Right, and that brings, I was going to ask you, then after you um, you had, you had, stepped down and then you were the co-director out at Burke? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what happened was uh, I reached age 65 and then went on a little past because they hadn't completed the, the search for the uh, sure. new dean and, or she, was, uh, she wasn't able to come in. So I stayed on for another six months uh, past the, the normal date. Um, then... Uh, by that time, we had a new provost, uh, Sally Mason, and, and and she asked if if I would be willing, you know, what were my plans? I said, well, I'm going back to the faculty and enjoy myself. And she said, well, would you, uh, would you, well, actually it was Chip, uh, the person. Rutledge? Who, Chip Rutledge, who had been uh, head of uh, pharmacy, uh, had, had been asked to step in as a sort of interim vice president for research. Um, Chip came to see me and asked, said, he and Sally had talked, and would I uh, be willing to do that? Well, that was my, I, I had pushed very hard to, to have that building. In fact, it had been top of my priority list. I'd known Mike Burke for a number of years. I'd known Don Cyphers. In fact, I'd been with him when we went out sure. to talk with him about getting the funding for it, uh, and it was the first building built. And so I, I felt a, first of all, I wanted to do it, and second of all, I felt a strong obligation to try to get that off and running the way we had said we would. So uh, I told him I would do it, but I had, it had been 36 years and I, uh, at that point or, or more, and I hadn't had a sabbatical yet. 
And so I would do it if, uh, if they would agree to have Jim Cooper be co-director. And, uh, and I, when I said, and I mean co-director, I mean I, I, I will be the co-director and Jim will be the, <laughs> there won't be a director. And that worked out very well. I did indeed get to take my six months and go on sabbatical. Jim just worked his head off on this thing, really handled all the details uh, sure. of the building planning and getting it underway. And we put together the policies for, it operates as a, as a, as a communal laboratory, not as individual. Lab. This is very foreign to uh, uh, our normal mode of operation. Right. Uh, when, when I left out there, we had 137 faculty members from 27 different departments all working in the... That's so very so it, it really uh, it really turned out to be a, right. a nice thing. I want to ask you about a couple of committees. When you were, you served on the Presidential Search Committee, didn't you? I you did. A lot of committees you've been involved in, but that yes. was kind of key because that's... Yes, I was on the Search Committee that brought in uh, Martin Jisk. Uh -huh. And um, there were two members of the Board of Trustees on there and... Uh, the usual mix of... Mike Burke was the co-chair on that, I think. Not on that one. He may, or he may have been on the other yeah, one. Yeah, I think it was the other one. Okay. Uh, and um, it was very interesting. The um, I, I don't know how much uh, I can say. Uh, no, that's, but um, it's an important... It, it, was, it, it was important, and, and I was... Uh, that was an opportunity for me to see how the Board of Trustees uh, right. worked close up and I would really develop uh, that and then a lot of, from a number of other things, developed a lot of respect for the people that were our trustees. They really had the best interests of the university and the students and the faculty at heart. And um, at one point we'd gotten, we narrowed it down quite a bit to uh, some finalists. Uh, and um, they actually uh, backed away, decided that they should keep looking, um, sure. and uh, my understanding is they finally convinced uh, right. Martin to come, and that uh, that was a, tr a transformative uh, event, I think, when he came. Yeah, I think so. The uh, Also, you, uh, let me ask you this, you're on the Purdue Research Foundation Board of Directors? There is a, yeah, was, uh, how, uh, that's, how not the, that's not the right uh, word, and I, I can't remember how they the call foundation. it, but it was a, it was a, it's an advisory group okay. uh, and has mostly uh, uh, alums and, and people from industry on it, and there were, uh, it's I, an advisory I think traditionally PRF. the Dean of Engineering had been on there, and uh, um, so I, I served in, in that capacity. Right, okay, okay. Uh, one of the things that I think is that I was going to ask you about was the um, that the Richard J. Schwartz Engineering Scholarship Fund. Yeah, that was yes. that was. And very I saw nice. the newspaper picture when they had the party. You and uh, Lyle Albright are doing the um, little sketches that he does, or yeah. whatever, or the magic yeah. thing that he does. Yeah, he does. <laughs> it was a good one. <laughs> uh, that was a surprise. That that was uh, when That's I stepped nice. down as dean. They had a they had a very nice. Uh, 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 event event out in, on the tent on the on the wall right out there and uh, as a surprise all of a sudden they announced that they had uh, established the the uh, scholarship have fund. you been are you involved at all in the selection of no, the people oh, no, okay. it's it's handled by the university and I think do you meet any have you met any of the students that have received um, it we yes and, okay. and we get uh, we used to get uh, their names, and now it just designates the uh, sure. the department that they're going yeah. to. In fact, we just last week received a, a notice. Nice. It's, it's a, yeah. it, uh, it was probably the finest thing they could have done I, I, for me. I, I really appreciated <laughs> it very much. How about the Sagamore of the Wabash? Um, Were you surprised when you got that? I was, yeah, I had no idea at all. <laughs> they, 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 at what event? How did they work? They did actually at uh, at one of the retirement uh, <laughs> events, and, and uh, it was uh, nicely framed. You know, yeah, it's very nicely framed. It's it's a very nice honor. It I, is. I was I was very pleased to <laughs> to receive it. <laughs> oh, here's another one. I think is that the International Engineering Consortium. There, there's, there's, <coughs> that's a that's a nonprofit group that does education. Very nice. Focused. Primarily on the uh, communications industry, and but your pioneering work in the field where the cells was mm -hmm. yeah, part they, of the salutation was very nice. Uh, work on photovoltaics and yeah. some of this sort of thing. Um, let's, and uh, you are also with the Big Ten Engineering Deans, and that's 
when you were the dean and things of that right. sort. And you've been involved with ASWE and right. the council and whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how about family? You want to talk a little bit about? Well, we, uh, the, we have How many have, of the did children all go to Purdue? They all did. We, we have eight <laughs> children. We have four, four boys, four girls. Uh, some of them received uh, engineering degrees. Uh, the story we like the youngest one. Uh, they all want to follow dad. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. Uh, the, young, uh, the youngest one uh, got a management degree. Uh, and uh, the story we like to tell is that kids were around when she came back after she'd signed up. And uh, they asked her what she'd done, and she said, well, she signed up for management rather than engineering. And they gave her a hard time. and, and uh, she looked at him and said, someday all of you will work for me, <laughs> so, which may happen. <laughs> you never know. No, we have, uh, I think we have 13, the kids have something like 13 degrees from Purdue. Uh, go to very nice. Graduate degrees and some Craner degrees. And yeah, that. very good. Um, how about a favorite Purdue tradition? come to mind and uh, Yeah, it's going to sound a little self-serving, I think. Good, that uh, sounds good. Uh, while, I was, while I was head, we started the tradition of, of honoring our, our alums by uh, naming uh, uh, outstanding uh, electrical engineering alums. And uh, that continues today. Now they're, now they're over ECEs since because of the change in name. Uh, that and graduation are probably my, my two favorite traditions. Graduation because we see the students get out right. and it's, it's really uh, just a, a pleasure. It is. But, but the, the, the Outstanding Electrical Engineering Award uh, just gives me a great deal of personal pleasure because now we've, they've been out there now 20, 30, 40 years and they come back and we see what happened, what they've accomplished, what they've done. And right. they're all, everyone has picked for that is absolutely outstanding. And it's just a, a pleasure, for, I think, for the faculty to see what's to out interact. there. And hear how they uh, viewed their time here at Purdue. And, uh, what they did with their Purdue degree. What they did with them. Right, and, yeah. And so it's, uh, I think those are, uh, those are things that uh, I particularly nice. enjoy. How about an outstanding event in your life? Anything comes to mind? Oh, far and away, uh, yeah, my, my marriage to Mary Jo. Sounds good. Yeah. And in closing, I'll let you make some closing remark and comments on your part. Anything you'd like to say in summary? Well, I, it's, it's been a, my time at Purdue has been just a, a wonderful experience. Uh, President and, you Perry, gave, and you became the professor, right? I, I <laughs> and enjoyed I decided it. that uh, <laughs> the best, probably, uh, certainly the very best <laughs> job in the world is to be a tenured full professor, uh, certainly at Purdue. And, sure. and, and Steve Beering used to like to talk about the Purdue family, and you know, it's really true. Uh, the students are, are just a pleasure. Uh, I, can't, I can't tell you how much joy I've gotten out of uh, teaching the undergraduates and out of my graduate, my graduate students who become colleagues and then become friends uh, and watch their accomplishments. Uh, the alums, uh, we, one thing about being in the dean's office is we really, I think at that time we had about 60,000 uh, interning alumni. And, and you know, every last one that we met, and we met a few thousand of them over the yeah. time, um, were just outstanding. We, we uh, took a great deal of pleasure in that. And that, that was something I had no idea about as I entered the dean's office. And so, uh, I, I just have to say it's been uh, the, the research experience, the idea that I can walk down the hall and talk to a world's expert in this right. and go down the hall, another hall, and another one. It's just been uh, just a wonderful, a wonderful uh, place to spend my, spend my time. Good. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Thank I appreciate you. that. Thank you. <clears throat>